Hello and welcome back to Office Hours Live. Uh, the January 10th, I believe it is, uh, 2017. We've got 10 days left in the Obama administration uh, before Donald Trump becomes President of the United States. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, one of the hearings uh, that is going on in Washington on Trump's uh, uh, cabinet picks uh, is Jeff Sessions for Attorney General. Now, there are a lot of reasons why Jeff Sessions should not be uh, Attorney General. And you and I have talked about them, and I've written about them, and you've read about them, and you know about them. Uh, but one uh, has not really been talked about. Uh, there's a connection between the Attorney General, whoever is the Attorney General, and also what is a very important topic that is going to get a lot of attention very soon, but is not getting attention. And what we try to do in Office Hours Live is use this as an opportunity to show the big picture. Right? That's what we're going to do. And then I'm going to take your questions. All right. Big picture has to do with Donald Trump and lawbreaking. Because, you see, Donald Trump has already, in many respects, if he were president already now, he would have broken a number of laws. And the attorney general is going to be in a very pivotal position to determine whether that law-breaking constitutes an impeachable offense. Uh, by the way, uh, in terms of law-breaking, there are two areas that I want to bring to your immediate attention. Uh, I'm just going to put Trump, Trump law breaking here and fill this in a little bit so that we know who we are talking about. This is, this is Donald Trump and this is Trump's hair. Uh, now, uh, with regard, I've got to find orange. Yes, all right. Now, with regard, uh, the first issue with regard to law breaking is Article 1, Section 9, which is called the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. Uh, here's my little handy-dandy constitution. You ought to have a constitution. You need to have a constitution because a lot of issues that are going to be in the constitution are going to be quite front and center over the next year or two. Uh, but Article 1, Section 9, and I don't even have to refer to it, it's called the Emoluments Clause. It simply means that a president, no high office holder in the United States, uh, can get gifts from foreign governments on the fear that the Founding Fathers had that if you are uh, in, in any way dependent on foreign governments, you are going to be compromised, obviously, in terms of your ability uh, to fulfill your oath of office, to do what you are supposed to be doing for the American people. Uh, Donald Trump has so many foreign investments that he's unwilling to put into a blind trust with a separate independent trustee overlooking it, that Donald Trump is already, if he were president right now, he would be violating the Emoluments Clause. Not only is he meeting with foreign dignitaries and being on the phone with foreign dignitaries, uh, but he's also, his Trump organization is doing such things as, for example, directing foreign dignitaries to stay at the Trump International Hotel in Washington when they're in Washington. Instead of Blair House, which is where they normally, in fact, always have stayed. So this is just one of many, many examples of Donald Trump profiting from being president. Now, he's not president yet, mind you, but a week from Friday he will become president. And if he profits from being president in terms of foreign governments in any way making him better off, that violates the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9. Uh, there is something else that has come up quite recently, and that is the 1967 anti-nepotism law. Now, Donald Trump has decided that his son-in-law and business partner, Jared Kushner, is going to be his special advisor, the presidential senior advisor to the president. This is a very important role. I've been in the White House. Uh, I've understood and seen exactly what senior advisors do. Uh, they have a very clear, critical, important role in terms of public policy making. And the reason that the anti-nepotism law was put into place was there was a feeling, uh, in fact, a very broad feeling in the public and in Congress, uh, that we didn't want the, even the appearance of somebody getting high public office, not out of their expertise or competence, but because they were a family member. 
Do you see the problem? So he hasn't even begun, and he's got two potential legal infractions. There's also, obviously, I don't even need to say this, but if there is more investigation, and I believe that there will be more investigation of the Putin connection, and if there's any suggestion and, or any evidence that Donald Trump actually did collaborate with Vladimir Putin or with the Russians in terms of their intervention in the election that is also a major constitutional offense that's called treason. Now what do you do about all of this and why is this related to the Attorney General and Jeff Sessions? It's related in the following way. You're following me so far? Class? See isn't this great to have office hours live? because we can get into these details. All right, the first is impeachment. Uh, Article 1, Section 5 of the handy-dandy Constitution that I want you to get. Uh, now, impeachment really is only about high crimes and misdemeanors, but there's been, never been a definition of high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, a, a president has never been fully impeached and convicted. We've had a couple of presidents who have been impeached by the House, but they have not been convicted by the Senate. There's also a second way Donald Trump might leave the White House, and that is the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. Hasn't been much thought given to the 25th Amendment. I haven't seen anybody talking about the 25th Amendment. Uh, but I want to read a little bit. This is section four of the 25th Amendment. Do you mind going into this? This is just a little, a little point. Whenever the vice president and majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the president uh, pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. In other words, this provision is put in in case the president is incompetent, just shows himself to be mentally deranged incapable of actually fulfilling the office, what is required of the presidency. Now, I'm not suggesting, and that would be unfair of me to suggest, before Donald Trump becomes president, I mean fully 10 days before he becomes president, that he may not have uh, what's necessary altogether up here to be president, and therefore the 25th Amendment might be invoked. I'm just simply saying to you that there is an alternative route beyond impeachment, and that is the 25th Amendment. And so over the next few years, assuming Donald Trump stays in office and doesn't get so bored, he just leaves, one of these two routes might actually be invoked. And the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, would be in, in the middle of both of these. Do you follow my logic? It's a system. All right, come over here. Let's take your questions. A lot to talk about today, and uh, many of you have a lot of questions. Uh, Alberta Visengardi uh, I want to talk about how no laws or rules or pretty much anything seems to apply to Trump. He hasn't supplied anything the past presidents have. I don't get it. Why is he untouchable? Well, Alberta, I just sort of uh, touched on that a little bit in terms of untouchability. Uh, he's not president yet. Uh, there is no law that says he's got to provide his tax returns. Uh, there is a law with regard to conflicts of interest. He says it doesn't apply to him. Uh, that is a question that could be tested in court and might actually be tested in court. Uh, Patricia Dumas, uh, Sessions says he doesn't like Roe against Wade, but will follow the law as he will uh, with everything he disagrees with. Is this dangerous? Does he have leeway in these decisions and their enforcement? Uh, Patricia, let me just say to you, I was once in the Justice Department. I was assistant to the Solicitor General. I litigated cases uh, for the United States on behalf of the United States, so I know that of which I speak. And although the Attorney General, uh, as Jeff Sessions said, he, he, he doesn't like the law, but he will enforce the law, yes, 
yes, an attorney general is obligated to enforce the laws of the United States, but has a great deal of discretion as to how much enforcement resources he gives to enforcing that law, what, a pri what priority he gives to enforcing a law, or whether he and the Department of Justice basically turn their backs on enforcing a law. And let's say, for example, a particular state or a particular jurisdiction uh, just simply didn't want to uh, provide any abortion counseling or any abortions at all in violation of Roe v. Wade. Well, it would be consistent with the discretion, enforcement discretion of Jeff, of Jeff Sessions uh, or any attorney general to say, well, um, <clears throat> we may get to that, or yes, we're going to prosecute that, but uh, and that's a low priority. You see the problem. Uh, Ellie Villegid, uh, where can I call to show my disapproval of Sessions for attorney general? Uh, Ellie, and this goes to all of you, your members of Congress, you've got two senators and one representative, most of you, and that's where you need to put your pressure. And if you get together with your neighbors and friends, and if there are five of you, so much the better. Send a letter, send emails, and you also make telephone calls. If you have 20 people, even better. The more you can organize and mobilize other people to get to your two senators and your member of Congress, that is great. And if you happen to be in a blue state, that's fine. They need to hear from you. Uh, if you're in a red state, even better. They need to hear from you uh, because they're all worried about, even those who are in relatively safe districts, they are, believe me, I have been there, they're worried about getting reelected. They want to be reelected. Uh, Christine Case, is it, Christine? Uh, while it seems like the congressional phone lines are all tied up uh, near, with nearly uh, everyone, there with everyone calling, uh, which is great. Uh, should we focus on the media, call the networks, cable news, ask them to focus on McConnell's hypocrisy, for example? Uh, Christine, uh, yes, I think you can also write uh, a letter to the editor of your local newspaper, write an op-ed, uh, approach your local public radio station to the extent that they take calls. Uh, there, don't feel that you are in any way limited just in terms of reaching a member of Congress. You need, and this is a kind of a, a process all of you and I are constantly going through to understand that you have power and as a citizen you have power as a voice. Your voice is critically important and so yes, Use every outlet you have uh, to make your, your voice known and your voice and your, your opinions known. Uh, Marion Duffy, Marion Duffy. I live in a state where my representatives are already doing what I think are great things. Uh, what can I and the community groups I'm a member of do to help? Should I call other states? Should I call my representative and say thank you? Uh, Marion, uh, yes all of the above. That is, call your representative and call your senators. If they're doing the right thing, say, great, uh, I'm with you. They need to hear that too, because they are presumably also hearing from people who don't agree with what they're doing. Uh, so give them all the support they can possibly get if they are doing the right thing, and encourage them to do even more. Uh, Sarah Minnis, uh, how can we play by the rules with those who refuse to acknowledge there are rules to begin with. Uh, Sarah, the question you're asking is how much hardball uh, Democrats and independents, the rest of us, ought to be playing. And my rule of thumb is, yes, play hardball, but keep in mind that we care about the institutions of democracy. We're not going to do what Republicans have done, and that is play fast and loose with those institutions. But by all means, play hardball in terms of making sure that your voice, your message, your organizing, your mobilizing, your activism uh, is making a ruckus. I, I call, I, I use the term peaceful resistance very often. And what I really mean is everything from making a fuss, demonstrating, making sure that the media hears what you're saying, making sure that members of Congress hear what you're saying, but also at the same time uh, making sure that it is, it is peaceful. Uh, 
and, and peacefulness and peace is critically important uh, because not because once it turns violent, uh, then the the rest of the public are not going to be hearing. Uh, they just see violence, and that's 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 really a a uh, difficult way. That's impossible. It's impossible to organize and mobilize people around around violence. But anything you know, anything that has to do with making a ruckus that is a peaceful ruckus, uh, we need to do, and we need to do it immediately. Uh, Maggie Clark. There are many resistance organizations springing up, but none are organized for, or formally part of the Democratic Party. This seems like a recipe for wasted time. Maggie, it's not. Uh, the Democratic Party is right now in the midst of trying to decide what it is going to be, what it is going to do. Uh, there is a race for the new head of, the new chair of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, Keith Ellison is one candidate. Uh, Tom Perez is another candidate. I know both of them. Uh, the issue is not so much who becomes the head of the DNC, it's how they understand the role of the DNC. And the more ruckus you can make, uh, the more uh, peaceful resistance is out there, uh, the more I think they're going to get the message that the Democratic Party has to transform itself from a giant fundraising machine, going after especially big money, into a movement. And if it doesn't, there's going to be a third party. Yosef Barber, uh, when Bernie lost the nomination, we thought there'd be a third party. What happened to that? Well, that just, you know, these are pretty good questions. They follow exactly what I'm saying. Uh, Yosef, uh, I think the, the problem with third parties in the United States is that because we have a winner-take-all system, that is, if you win most of the votes in a state in a presidential election, you get all of the state electors, it is very difficult for a third party to get going without risking taking votes away from the major party that is most like the third party in terms of values. And that's historically why third parties have been such a difficult thing to, to organize. My point is the Democratic Party has right now a huge opportunity. It can fill a major void right now in terms of this resistance agenda that we've been talking about. The progressive wing of the Democratic Party is not just a wing, it is the base of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party really is not big business and Wall Street. And if the Democratic Party understands that and understands the energy and the force and the enthusiasm, I mean, look at what Bernie Sanders accomplished. If the Democratic Party understands that and, and fills that void, there is a future for that Democratic Party. If it doesn't, then I think there is a risk for the Democratic Party of seeding that enthusiasm, that grassroots activism to a third party. And I think there will be a third party. Barbara Lipsky, how can we stop him, that is Trump, I assume, Barbara, from dismantling the CIA, FBI, and agencies protecting the country? Uh, he's not going to dismantle them. I think the, ba the big danger is that he will only listen to what he wants to listen to. And that's Trump's problem. That is the problem we all face with Trump. Because not only does Trump spout lies almost compulsively and consistently, big lies, but he also seems to have no interest at all in the truth. The whole issue of him bad-mouthing and denigrating the CIA, FBI, NSA is about him not wanting to hear what they had to say. And his same attitude, and he has the same attitude with regard to government information agencies and those parts of the government that are concerned with put it with creating and finding the truth information bureau of labor statistics or the scientists and the scientific community that is hired by the government in terms of the environment or any other issue if donald trump was, doesn't want to hear the truth we've got a huge problem on our hands and it looks like he doesn't and so we do kathy sullivan who runs the appointment of Trump's son-in-law through the proper oversight and regulation? Is it subject to the same level of scrutiny? Kathy, no. It's an appointment that is not a cabinet-level appointment. It is not a confirmation-level role, but it is an official role. And that anti-nepotism law of 1967 was put into effect not only for cabinet-level appointments, 
that have to go through the confirmation process, but also for non-confirmation processes. Jody Deerfield, if an investigation for some impeachable offense began, do you think the Republican Congress would protect Trump, at least for appearances, or throw him under the bus? Uh, Jody, initially they will protect Trump because he was elected and the Republicans are basking in, the, in, the, in, in what they feel is a wonderful, wonderful result of the election in giving them both houses of Congress uh, and also giving them most of these uh, state houses. Uh, but that's going to wear off pretty soon. It's going to wear off uh, because over time they are going to find that Trump is not exactly the person who they uh, who agrees with them on every issue. In fact, there are a lot of issues they already disagree on. Uh, and when you get to the nitty gritty of governing, uh, those tensions are going to get larger and larger. Uh, but also, it's going to be clear to them that Donald Trump is an albatross uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, because Donald Trump has, uh, just because of who he is, uh, turned off, antagonized so many Americans, uh, blacks, Latinos, women, uh, and not just blacks, Latinos, and women. I mean, uh, average Americans who are seeing more and more of his bizarre personality, disorder. And so the Republicans faced with that albatross will be readier and readier. I don't know, it may take a year or two years, but they will be ready to throw him under the bus because he is going to make it very difficult for them in the 2018 midterm elections and in the 2020 elections. Sue Keston, if impeached, are we stuck with Pence? And is that any better? Uh, Sue, we are stuck with Pence. I do think it's better. I'll tell you why. Because Mike Pence is a ferocious, venal right-winger. That is true. But I'd rather deal with a predictable right-winger than with somebody who is and has a personality disorder. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I think Donald Trump is dangerous. Uh, a right-winger who is president uh, is not great, but at least you know where he's coming from. You can organize around much more traditional issues. Democratic, Republican, big government, small government. I mean, we've been here before. We had Ronald Reagan. We had Richard Nixon. We know what this means. We don't want to know what it means to have somebody who is Donald Trump and has not just a personality disorder, but also has tendencies toward tyranny. And I mean that quite literally. Trump has no idea what the democratic institutions of government are all about. He just wants power and attention. And he acts over and over again like a little, spoiled, vindictive, angry child. And in 10 days, he's going to have the nuclear codes, which means that four minutes after he makes a vindictive decision, the world could be blown up. I don't want to panic you. I just want you to understand why Mike Pence might be better than Donald Trump. Kathy Fitter, uh, what factors precipitate a mental health assessment? Uh, Kathy, there is nothing in law or in the Constitution uh, that tells us what a mental health assessment is going to be and what triggers it, we have to rely on, if you look at the 25th Amendment, the vice president and the major officers of government simply coming to that conclusion. And they may well. Elaine Palmer, do you have any suggestions for how to cope? Elaine, I do. And let me tell you, many of you, because you write to me uh, or I see you, uh, or you, uh, you, you are on my Facebook page, uh, you say uh, you're panicked. I understand that. I wake up many mornings feeling the same thing. I care about this country. I care about the world. I care about my kids. I have a grandchild. I am sometimes, when I wake up early in the morning, very panicked about what is about to occur. Uh, but what I tell myself and what I want you to tell yourself is that doesn't help. 
it's very important not to panic. It's very important not to be cynical and say nothing, nothing we do can help. That is also an emotion that you need to avoid. And I would also urge you to avoid normalizing the situation. This is not a normal situation. This has never happened before. We've never had somebody as impaired, seriously, as Donald Trump become president. So what does it mean you do? If you're not going to panic and you are not going to normalize and you're not going to be cynical, what does it mean you do? I think you have to be indignant. You have got to be angry. And you've got to use that anger and indignance in a positive way in terms of organizing and mobilizing, becoming an activist. We've talked about this already. And a lot of what I post on this page has to do with helping you, giving you the tools to be a citizen activist. And that's what you need to be. That itself is going to be helpful. The more activist you are, the more you're going to feel you are part of changing what is about to occur. Stevie Jean, Stacy Jean, I see two monsters damaging our democracy, Trump and big corporations. What do you think about the power of using boycotts to flex our consumer muscles? Uh, Stacy, absolutely, yes. You may have some, seen something I posted yesterday about a woman who went to a Dairy Queen in Illinois and the owner, when she asked that her order be fulfilled, uh, used the N-word against her and her children. And she said she was offended, and he said, well, there's nothing you can do about it. And then she posted on Facebook exactly what had happened. And she got thousands of responses. And two days later, the corporation, Dairy Queen, closed that franchise, kicked the guy out. Now, what I take from that is that boycotts matter, that uh, consumer opinions matter. There are many, 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 many of us. Corporate Mer America depends on us, depends on our goodwill our, as consumers. And so, yes, organize boycotts. Let your voice be heard, not just politically, but also in terms of your consumer voice. Kim Dillon, as a Canadian, I'm concerned about NAFTA and how changes to that will impact cross-border trade. Will we see trade wars? Uh, Kim, I hope not. I don't think we're going to see trade wars. I think the real problem with trade in the United States is that we do not have in this country a system for helping people who lose their jobs because of trade or because of technological change or any other reason find new jobs that pay as well or get income support that pays as well. In other words, we have no safety net. Even unemployment insurance only reaches about 16% of people who now lose their jobs. And so naturally, if trade and a trade agreement results in job losses, people are desperate. That's the problem, Kim. So instead of focusing on trade as the problem, I think we ought to tr uh, focus on the fact that we don't have any system in place for helping our people. Technology and technological change is taking away many more jobs than trade. Sonia Beals, does legislation like that introduced by Elizabeth Warren to require tax returns have any hope of passing? Sonia, it doesn't have any hope of passing right now, but it's worth introducing those pieces of legislation because they are sort of flags put in the soil for when Democrats again get back the Senate or the House. And I believe that Trump is going to be such a disaster and that so many of you are turning into citizen activists that when it comes to the 2018 midterm elections and certainly the 2020 elections, the Republicans have a serious problem on their hands. Democrats may well take back both houses of Congress. Laura Jodice, is the accusation of plagiarism currently facing Monica Crowley and her PhD dissertation valid 
Does this hold any sway over appointment to the National Security Council? Uh, Laura, it may hold some sway, although plagiarism is very, very hard to prove. Uh, if it's a clear-cut case, yes, that has a, you see, it's all about ethics. Can I just go back to this, this moral issue here? It's at the core of, the, uh, of many of the questions you all have raised. It's about a failure to disclose financially. It's about conflicts of interest. It's about plagiarism. This is going to be the most ethically challenged administration in history. And anything we can do to make more visible all of the ethical problems and challenges and issues that lie at the heart of this new administration, all the better. People need to see it in all its inglory. Catherine Narjan, can the ethics office do anything other, oh, after the fact, if it finds conflicts, uh, after the hearings or after the uh, confirmation? Uh, yes. The ethics office, as long as there's an independent ethics office, and you remember, uh, this is a good example of public opinion, uh, because last week, uh, the House Republicans, they were ready to close the independent House ethics office, fold it under the political ethics committee, uh, and there was so much public anger, public opinion against that. Donald Trump says he got credit. No, Donald Trump doesn't get credit. Uh, it's the public who Donald Trump is very, very interestingly, he's very attuned to. He's a con man, he's a marketer, he's Barnum and Bailey Circus. He knows public opinion and he can see when something requires some change and that ethics move by the House was stopped in its tracks because the public was so upset. Good sign, important, very good sign. Lucas Jones, should inequality be factored into traditional macroeconomic uh, economic models? For example, focusing on the marginal propensity to save as it differs between high and low income earners. Lucas, you want me to put on my economics hat here for you? Let me just say, yes, we need, in evaluating how the economy is doing, we need to look at who's winning and who's losing. And if the economy overall is doing very well, uh, but most of the gains or all of the gains are going to people at the very top, and most people are no, not doing very well at all, that is an economic failure. That's not an economic success. Two more. Uh, Paolo Lim, are you confident that you will see the peak of this Republican Party's power in your lifetime? Well, Paolo, I have no idea how long I'm going to live, uh, but I am confident that there is massive, already massive, overreaching. I mean, if you look at the gerrymandering, if you look at voter suppression at the state levels, if you look at what the Republican Party is doing at the federal level, if you look at all of the ways in which Republicans, Mitch McConnell, good example. I mean, talk about hypocrisy. Uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, who said in 2009 he was not going to be uh, have any hearings or preside or participate in any hearings over Obama's uh, confirmation nominees uh, unless they had all their financial reports in. Now Mitch McConnell says, "Oh well, that's not necessary." Mitch McConnell, who would not even look at Obama's nominee for the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland. Because he said, oh, well, we have time. Uh, we ought to wait for a new president. Now says there is absolutely no time. We've got we've to jam these people through without any full information, without full information, uh, all the full disclosures, all the FBI checks, all of the financial disclosures. I think the, yes, I think that the public is going to catch on. The public is also going to catch on. Trump voters, working class Trump voters, they are going to catch on to the fact that Trump is putting uh, at, at least He's, put, he's filling his cabinet full of billionaires and Wall Streeters. And he's not draining the swamp. He's actually making the swamp deeper and putting more and more alligators and crocodiles in the swamp. The working class of America will see it. They're already seeing it. Uh, Nancy Wiley, are you going to the march in D.C.? Nancy, I wish I could. I am teaching on Friday, but... A lot of people right here in this room, sitting behind the counter, uh, you'll all put up your hands. Yes, they're going to the march. In fact, everybody who's in this room is going <laughs> to the march. Uh, so, and I hope you are. And if you're not, I put on this page uh, how you can find out about sister marches that are going on all over the country. They're going on probably near you. They're going on all over the world. I mean, this is another thing that gives me 
a, a sense of confidence. Even though I am worried sick about what's going to happen to this country under Trump, I, am, I, I have a degree of confidence because I see how much resistance is already being created. Those sister marches are sprouting up all over. And I urge you, and we'll talk about this next week as well, I urge you, men as well as women, and uh, every, everybody, get and demonstrate, show how much opposition there is to this Trump and the reign of Trump. And on that upbeat note in a very downbeat period of American history. I want to thank you for joining me. Uh, we are going to do every day our short 5 p.m. resistance reports, 5 p.m. on Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, because uh, a lot of you have said that they're helpful to you. What I try to do in those short five to eight minutes uh, resistance reports is just to, to show you the pattern, uh, to give you context for what the news is, what's happening, what Trump is doing, uh, what we need to do every day. Uh, and then uh, once a week, we'll do these, uh, these office hours lives to give you uh, office hours live to give you a little bit more in depth assessment and also answer your questions. And I hope this is helpful to you. And we'll see you at five o'clock and also or eight o'clock and we'll see you next week. Bye.